see. Okay. And play. All right. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be here. And um, I have so much respect for all the panelists on this panel, some who I've known a long time, some who we still work with referring kids. So I wanted to start, I, I really like the opening slide, how it talked about mirror neur neurons and taking care of your kids starts with taking care of yourself. And I'm just gonna offer a 30 second grounding little mindfulness practice that I just encourage everyone, all of us and everyone in the audience to do. It's so easy to just drop into this present moment with a few nice deep breaths. So I invite you just to get comfortable. It's only gonna be 30 seconds long, everyone can do it. Get comfortable, feel the feet on the ground. Maybe you're sitting, I happen to be standing. And uh, if you'd like to close your eyes, you're welcome to do that. And we're just gonna start with first the sound. And just taking in one nice deep breath in, breathing in. And breathing out. Breathing in. And breathing out. Just feel your body, whatever you're in contact with, breathing in. Breathing out. Maybe it's your feet on the floor, how you're sitting. Feel the ground wherever you can feel the ground. Breathing in. Breathing out. On this next breath, breathing in. Let's breathe out a little longer. A little extended exhale. Let's try that again. Breathing in. And the long breath out. Feeling your body, feeling what's around you. Breathing in. Breathing out. Gonna play the chime and just listen to the sound as it fades away. Breathing in. Breathing out. Okay, thank you. Ah, Help me get a little more grounded before giving a short talk. So it is so important to take care of yourself. If the cabin loses air pressure, put your own mask on, then help your children. It, we just can't overemphasize that. Um, I'm gonna offer a framework. At, at Gateway Mountain Center, we, we work with some of the highest need youth in our community. For eight years, we've been doing a therapeutic mentoring program with really helping kids who have serious emotional disturbance. And that's not really the topic tonight. The topic tonight is for all parents, all children. Um, but we, we feel in our experience that we've developed a framework that is useful for all parents. So I'm offering kind of a thousand foot view framework around how youth can develop a stronger sense of self. And with a stronger sense of self, they have more resilience. And I, I do think this applies across all ages because our work um, tends to be in the adolescent and teen area, although we, we, we do have some kids we help who are five and six. We, the sweet spot for us is probably 14. And I, I know a, a number of our panelists really work with younger kids as uh, elementary school counselors. So I'm gonna offer a little bit pertaining to adolescents and teenagers. But um, yeah, we're Gateway Mountain Center and um, we do work with high need youth, as I said. So kids who have had serious adverse childhood experiences, complex trauma, maybe they have a learning difference. Some of our kids have substance use issues. Um, our program is called Whole Hearts, Minds and Bodies, but we also do a lot of programming in the school district, um, enrichment programs for special ed, um, all sorts of wellness programs and alternative ed. Our framework we call Four Roots for Growing a Human, and I'm just going to briefly go through these. Our most important root number one, authentic relationship. 
this is such a challenge during these times when we were told to shelter in place, we're scared of each other in a certain way, we're not in contact. It's the hardest thing. And um, I like to say human beings ultimately are cuddling monkeys. We are supposed to be connected and children need this, parents need this, all humans need this. And it's been so challenging to, to navigate these times, to be healthy, to be emotionally um, sound when we're not able to have touch as much, when we're not able to be connected as much. So authentic relationship across all ages. One thing I noticed, so I'm a grandfather. I'm also a parent, but I'm a grandfather. And um, this has really changed. And, and I think that um, in our society, we parenting has gotten a little more intense and a little more, um, oh, let's say, safety conscious and controlling. And and I, I'm, I notice when I take my grandson to the playground, when I was a little kid in the 60s, our parents were way over there and we just worked it out. And today, like, my grandson and, a, and another little five-year-old hit the ladder for the, the slide at the same time. They don't even get a chance to work through it. There's parents there to mediate, to referee, to be like, she was first, he was first. And uh, I think that's just an interesting reflection. Our kids to really develop social emotional skills need the practice of engagement. And I, I do encourage parents to reflect on that. Um, just how can you really keep your kids safe, but foster a little bit of freedom for them to learn. Um, I was with another grandparent, um, Eileen Newton, a kid zone, and we just sit back and watch it all happen, and it's super fun. Um, authentic relationship also, as in adolescence, is so key. When parents call me just asking for advice, I, I find it useful to ask them to imagine how did we live 2,500 years ago? Because there's very little evidence that we have evolved in the last 2,500 years very much in terms of neurologically. 2,500 years ago, we would have lived in a small band of 45 to 60 people in deep interdependent connectivity. Um, and, and in modern society, we don't have that. But adolescents are still seeking that kind of authentic relationship with other adults. They are hardwired for that. They wanna learn from other tribe members. And, this is a really important point, I think. When we see kids who really struggle, who have problems, but they make it through, the number one factor, and this is shown in many, many studies over the last 40 years, the number one factor is they develop a consistent, caring relationship with a non-parental adult. This is key. We think the nuclear family has to be the be all and end all, but in our, our kids want to do that. They wanna learn from other adults. And, it really helps with adolescents and teens to, for a parent to help just open those doors. They have to, the kids have to find their own passions and their own interests. But I think we need to do a better job of that. And it's so hard during a pandemic. There's so much less of that. But I think when something is lacking, we can look at ways to, to rebuild those connections. So authentic relationship. Connecting to nature. It is now proven empirically. They can do, um, all sorts of blood tests and see that when you're out in nature, your immune system is strengthened. And we take it for granted living up here, but a lot of the kids we work with, as they get older, do not have a relationship with nature. They might see it out the window, they drive by it. But um, it is, um, if you spend three days on a backpack trip, your killer T cells, the backbone of your immune system, improves by 50%. That's huge. 30 days later, they can do a blood draw. You are still 20% improved over the time before you went on that time in nature. So a lot of us live near trees, but I'm talking about really engaging with nature. Kids are so enriched by the sensory inputs of sight, smell, sound, touch, patterns, the rustling of leaves, the sunlight beaming through trees, the sounds of squirrels. and I think with the initial shelter in place saying, don't go outside, don't go to parks, I really think we overdid it and, um, and we see suffering from that. So I really encourage all parents, little kids do it naturally, you let them out the door. A lot of our adolescents stop doing it in any way that we can get um, adolescents and teens to actually be outside, breathe in those terpenes coming off the forest trees. It's really beneficial. 
Um, what we call embodied peak experience, the flow state. Again, little kids do this naturally. They just drop into that state when they play. As kids get older, they, they lose that connection. This is the present moment experience of moving your body outdoors, walking on rough ground, kayaking in a lake, walking on logs across trees, snowshoeing in the snow. Maybe there's a little bit of risk. They're walking on rocks, they're jumping off rocks, they're climbing trees. This stuff, um, neurologically, the connection between the balance centers in our brain and our emotional regulation is being learned. We're learning more about that with brain scans that are very current. And it's a strong connection, there's a strong correlation. We see that on our work when we help kids get in their bodies as they improve their kinetic quality, they, their behavior improves, their ability to regulate emotionally, their ability to have relationship, all of that improves because through the body, we develop our sense of self. So um, finding, it, you know, it doesn't have to be rappelling off a cliff, it can just be walking on rough ground in nature, but helping your kids find that activity that they love to do. And again, we know these have been limited, during these times, so it takes that extra effort. Um, connecting nature and embodied peak experience is a sense of wonder or awe. Um, one thing I, I counsel parents when maybe their child is starting to experiment with substances or something. Like, I would wake that kid up at four in the morning, you know, tell them in advance it's gonna happen. Go out to the lake, kayak, and watch the sun come up. I would meet the kids where they are and having those experiences together. That's the natural high. So embodied peak experience. And then the final piece of our framework is helping others, connecting to community through service. Adolescents are seeking meaning and being a back to the tribe frame. They wanna be useful members of their tribe. They wanna to connect to community and connecting to community through service is so beneficial. Um, I'll offer a couple more things. This is, again, it's a thousand foot framework that um, we have found useful in all along the path to build resilience. Um, one thing, a, a book just came out that I read that I, I love called The Power of Discord. And I wanna just bring this up. We worry about being perfect parents. The power of relationship is actually when it, the ups and downs, it, it doesn't work to have perfect relationship. It's the, the disconnect and then reconnect that actually builds our relational ability. This is, just came out a month ago by Edward Tronick, the psychologist who did the somewhat disturbing still face experiment in the early 70s. But it's, um, it's a good reminder, like kids won't learn to walk unless they fall down along the way. And we're not gonna have great relationships unless we experience that discord and repair, discord and repair, that's what strengthens a relationship. So a little diagram about this framework, it's all about growing sense of self. With a stronger sense of self, a child has more self-awareness, more self-efficacy, and all of this really helps them with regulating emotionally, with having better relationship with family, with facing setbacks and challenges. So I just offer this as an overarching framework. Um, we are available at Gateway Mountain Center. We have a new youth wellness center. We're doing pod learning programs. When parents are struggling, at, things get a little more serious we're always a bit available to take calls and give counsel and um, we will be contributing to the um, resource list and thank you very much we'll pass it back to the panel and um, really appreciate being here tonight thank you very much peter appreciate it um uh, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm not sure if everybody was quite on yet. We, you know, we have a really diverse group here that kind of come from different fields in terms of um, age groups that we work with, coming from the medical perspective, from the school counseling perspective. So, um, and also, you know, Rebecca at the Children's Center for the hospital. So, um, you know, some of this discussion is going to be a little bit broad because we do have a diverse group and I'm sure we have a diverse set of parents on here as well that have different challenges. Um, so, uh, so please start t uh, typing chat questions in the box. We'll, we'll get the discussion going here, but 
Um, I just wanted to see really quick if, if um, Jonathan, I'll start with you. Did you have anything you want to add on um, Peter's talk there? Any, anything to add to that? Well, I think like you said, I think there's lots of things Peter or any of us can add. It's such a broad topic, right? But uh, I think it's, um, I think, uh, you, you know, it, it's important. And uh, I, I think this might have been mentioned at the beginning. We talked about this idea of, of resilience in our children. And um, I, one of the things I want to make sure that parents understand is that sometimes resilience is actually our adult misinterpretation of how children are responding to stress because they are not fully developed. Uh, their amygdalas are not fully developed. Their stress responses are not fully developed. So they may um, behave in ways that we as adults interpret as they're managing something okay, um, or that they are um, that, that, that they are you know fine uh, or not feeling or not experiencing what we what we fear that they might be. Um, and this may not be the case. Uh, sometimes even small things really kind of uh, some small events will follow us for a long time. I'm sure all of us adults can think back to a particular, you know, person in middle school that, you know, three decades later, if we ran to, into them at the grocery store, we'd still have like this visceral, you know, like this visceral reaction, right? <laughs> um, and um, so one of the things I think is important, and we, we, we have talked about this, I think, the last uh, the last one of these discussions as well, and it's a constant theme in our field, is communication. Um, you know, just talking to each other. So many, so many of our problems can be solved by just engaging um, and talking to one another. Um, you know, making sure, and we can we can talk more about this along the way, that we are engaging with our kids, asking them questions, appropriate questions, sharing uh, with them uh, appropriate things for their developmental stage. Um, and, but otherwise, you know, Pete, you know, Peter, I think covered a, a lot of things really, really well. And in a short amount of time, did a great job uh, uh, explaining uh, some, of the, some of the difficulties, especially with the adolescent population. Absolutely, yes. And that, um, that brings us to our uh, next topic on communication. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to our, our school counselors here. Um, so I'll start, Jess, um, do you have any recommendations? You know, one of the challenges, the themes I've seen is I'm um, asking parents what their challenges were, you know, with the short, uh, well, probably seemed very long few months we had in the spring with homeschooling, but looking at communication with kids, um, because now, now their parents, their teachers, they're, you know, they've got multiple, even more multiple hats they're wearing, some are working at home. You know, what are some communication skills or strategies would you recommend to a, a parent that's just really kind of having a hard time getting through their child? Um, you know, what, uh, you know, be able to set up the structure for schooling at home and the importance of all of this? That's a lot of questions. That's a lot, it's a lot. <laughs> um, I, I'm gonna do my best to answer all of them. Um, I just wanted to first say thanks for inviting me. I'm really excited that um, you guys are putting this on for, for our community. And I think, um, you know, like Peter said, I'm happy to be on the panel with all these really great folks. Um, so I just wanna say that, um, uh, so I'm gonna speak from a like an elementary perspective. So that's a like TK for Kings Beach Elementary through fourth grade. So like four to 10, 11 year olds. Um, but you know, some of the great neuroscientists say that if it's good for one brain, it's good for all brains. So even if you are a, a you know a high school um, minded person, this might be okay for you too. Um, and also I want to throw out there that I do get how difficult this is. I have two small children. I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old. Um, and my four-year-old will be um, doing TK at Kings Beach Elementary this year. Um, so, um, you know, I get it um, experientially and also cognitively. Uh, so for little guys, um, it's kind of a funny thing because uh, we love, human beings generally like to use language to um, communicate. Uh, and that can be great, except for um, little people don't, that language center of their brain isn't really developed yet. And if we've experienced a trauma, which I think we can all agree that this is a global trauma we're all undergoing, that that can sometimes affect um, the language part of your brain. So communicating with little people means visuals. 
um, right? It doesn't mean a lot of words, less is more really, and drawing it out visually, um, you're gonna you're gonna get more out of it for kids um it's kind of the reason why we say like brush your teeth every night and the kids look at you like you never said it before right um setting up a visual schedule of pictures can be um in practicing too that's the other piece of that is like i'm i'm a prevention person so um practicing beforehand with your visuals is going to be more helpful than kind of talking it out um especially for our little people um I'm trying to think of some of the other things. Uh, I kind of forgot some of the questions that you had. Um, Liz, did I answer? That's perfect. No, it's it really, you know, communication strategies and skills. And I love that you mentioned for the particular age group, uh, elementary school kids, the visual, um, visual communication is really helpful. So I think that was, that was wonderful and a really good, um, a good piece of advice. Um, so, uh, Kelly, do you have anything to add in terms of, because you're also working with the same age group um, in, in kind of communicating what's going on in the world and how to help kids be successful, you know, schooling at home, why they have to be at home, and, and even maybe talk a little bit about uh, the lack of social interaction that, they, that they're used to having. You know, little kids are running and jumping, they're all over each other, and Rebecca can speak to that as well, but... Um, anything to kind of help parents with communication when it comes to, um, again, staying on track with school, but understanding that, you know, this is the way it is right now, coming up with new ways to interact with their classmates. Um, well, thanks for having me as well. And I agree with Jess and Peter and Jonathan. And um, I just want to say, yes, it's important that they keep communicating with um, their classmates, if it's at all possible. Um, maybe set up like a lunch bunch group where the kids could meet, like I do that at my school sometimes on Fridays. The kids can have their lunch with the counselor and then they can actually chat back and forth. Um, that, anything like that can really help. Um, but I do also wanna focus on really taking care of yourself as parents, because if, as healthy, uh, how you're feeling, um, is gonna definitely affect how your child's gonna react. So the more you can maybe make a structured environment, um, get a desk or a table and a spot where they're gonna actually do their online distance learning every day, um, have a schedule laid out, give them some tools before you start the distance learning um, or remote learning, maybe how to calm down when they get frustrated you know, there's like Calm 5 where they can reset and do some deep breathing. And I do a Calm 5 with the, the hand where they do some deep breathing and five deep breaths so they can calm down their, their emotions, but also acknowledging their emotions. They're going to have good ones and probably some um, not so good ones. And just saying, yeah, I can see you're really upset and maybe take a brain break at that time or take a walk outside. So just letting it and not having to have it perfect every day. It's not going to be great every single day. And it's okay that some days might be a little rougher than others. And, um, and each day, it's a new day. They can start over. And that's what kind of how we see with behavior, you know, at school every day, every kid gets a brand new chance the next day. And so at home, you can use those kind of as a reminder that this too shall pass and that um, we're all going to get through it. And probably our kids are going to remember, our young kids are going to remember less about it than um, we will. We'll, we'll, we'll have it with us. And so any resiliency you can build in and talking about their emotions when they're having really strong ones and taking a break from school if it's not working right in that moment. And I think that was it. Oh, I have a book that I wanted to recommend called <clears throat> Permission to Feel by Mark Brackett. He's, and it's a really great book. I've been listening to it on Audible and I really highly recommend it because I think uh, when I grew up, we, you know, I wasn't as much allowed to share my emotions. I had four brother, two, two brothers and two sisters. So it was, uh, you didn't really talk about your emotions a lot. And I think now we're trying to teach kids to do that. So I hope that is helpful and thank you. Oh, absolutely. That was very helpful. 
my family's English, so we don't talk about <laughs> emotions either. <laughs> um, I think, uh, was it you the other night, Kathy, that talked about um, uh, good enough parenting? Is that you that mentioned that or Rebecca? Um, yeah, I think we're all doing the best we can. And I don't yeah, know I, if it was Rebecca or I, but I agree with that. You know, we're I, I like that point. Trying times. <laughs> yeah, well, people put a lot of pressure on themselves um, to do this perfectly, and I imagine all of all of us in our respective professions do the same thing. Uh, and you know, a lot of times we wouldn't talk to ourselves like we would another person. I think we have to remind ourselves to be patient that you know the kids aren't going to have the perfect school experience because it just it doesn't exist anyway, and we need to let go of being the perfect parent, absolutely. And, um, and everyone's so, going through it, right? Oh, we're all, we're all yeah. in this together, so we have yeah. to help each other out. Absolutely, I agree. Um, uh, so Rebecca, from your perspective, I mean, you've, you've been, the Children's Center's been open. Um, you've got, um, remind me the age range of children that you have in the, the Children's Center right now. Yeah, so um, we were open all through the entire pandemic. Um, our numbers got lower, which you can look at, that was sad because numbers were lower, but also it was a real advantage because the kids that were here really got a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention or one-on-two attention. And so that was really sweet. So our center starts in infancy, so we can take kids as young as six weeks. Um, they usually come a little older. We go all the way up to second grade. And so the bulk of our children are zero to five, and then we have a small before and after school care program. So currently we have about 110 kids that have come back to school. So it's pretty big. Um, by working with the hospital, you know, they're all essential workers. And so that makes it um, essential that we're here and that we were able to operate during the whole time. So it's a wide variety because you have the infants and toddlers, you know, and their level of cognition of what's going on is more, you know, kind of sensing and feeling. You have preschoolers of different ages, pre-K, and then we have our school age kids. So I would say what we're looking at for one is just having the kids find joy and dance and music and laughter. I mean, adding some normalcy while they're in childcare, but also, they need to have fun, you know? I mean, I, you just hear so much doom and gloom and the parents might be stressed out. And so I think for them to have a respite from that, from here is fun um, or make it fun. I also, we're really big on proactive learning. So we do mindfulness, we do um, some breathing techniques and we start teaching that really young. And so I think that piece of like, I want kids to have the tools before they need them. So as they go to school and as they get stresses or when things happen, um, and also I think it's important for us to teach the parents, like, this is what we're doing with the kids too, so that they have those skills. So when we're doing different breathing techniques, the parents can know what we're doing. Like, why is your kid doing that? It's like, well, they're, you know, they're doing the faucet or they're doing the balloon or, you know, some different things that they have to go with that. So I think, and doing that ahead of time so kids have that already in their practice. So we do it at circle time with the kids. We also do it like if we see they're getting frustrated. I see you're getting frustrated. Let's take a deep breath. What would you like to do about it? Um, the other thing we do, especially as the kids get older, is not as much telling them as much as really asking like, well, what was your idea to figure that out? You know, and it's amazing what they'll come up with really young, they've always surprised me. Like, how do you think that ought to work? Um, what do you think about it? And give them an opportunity to talk first. Um, and I like it, you know, even with the language isn't there too, it's still talking to them and being with them and giving them an opportunity to try. Um, the other one I, I like that you, we were talking about is definitely modeling for us as teachers, any adult that's in their life is to modeling. And we may seem frustrated. It's like, oh, I dropped that. I'm really disappointed, you know, but this is how I'm gonna fix it. And so when you're modeling that, it's not just that you're acting, but you're, you're using language that goes with that. I dropped that, I feel disappointed, now it's spilled, but I can clean it up. And I think just like running, a, having like a running language of what you're doing kind of helps kids develop language, but they can also see the processes of, of what you're doing as they're starting to develop language and that they're going, oh, if I just, 
spill something and I drop something, it's okay. And this is how we're going to fix it, you know? Um, so I think that's important. The other piece is just stories. There's so many books out there. Any of us go and call the library. I, I go by the library all the time and they're still open not to go in, but you can order books and drive by and they'll put them in your car. Um, but there's a lot of really good books on stress, anxiety, um, mindfulness, um, there's Zen Pig, there's just things that, and really read those so that kids have an opportunity to then have a discussion about like, you know, have you felt that way? Or I see in the book this child, you know, or this cartoon animal, looks like maybe their tummy isn't feeling good because they're worried, you know I mean? So you can look at those things, but I think having those and labeling those emotions far before you need it, just being very proactive, not waiting till you're in a crisis to be like, all right, now we're gonna breathe. And they don't know what you're talking about because they're all worked up <laughs> over it. So um, those are some of the things that we do here. We follow a lot of positive reinforcement too with c -Cephal. is just as much as you can say, you can do it, you're strong, you have, you know, really helping with that self-esteem and helping them. They can do it. They are powerful. Um, and I think that's a piece they're going to need to get over this too, is that positivity um, and modeling that positivity with children. So that's what we're doing. But we also have all the kids here. I do worry about the kids who are, haven't come back yet. So some of that is connecting with them, still sending um, emails to parents, having parents send pictures of their child having fun at home and doing learning activities or whatever we call those shelter and play, sending pictures and then we put those on the wall so that they can have that connection too. But I, I still think some of those kids who, when they come back to school, you know, they're not gonna start right where they left off. Like, oh, they know the teacher, they know all the rules. I mean, some of them are starting over and it's a lot of transitions and are really being patient with them too as they're coming back into care, or they're coming back into a group setting or they're coming back to, see grandma that they haven't seen for a while, just know it's not going to be the same as when they left because um, that time is so long for them and that connectiveness. So I would say just that patience and modeling and explaining this is what we're going to do ahead of time, you know, give an advance warning on things that you're going to do. We're going to go visit that this is going to happen and, or grandma might have a mask on or I told all my parents, I sent an email, when your child comes back, we're all wearing masks and they're not going to be used to that. So let your child know this is a new protocol too. So as much as you can give them that advanced warning on stuff, I think is really important at this time. That's great. I, I liked how you mentioned the, you know, being proactive with this stuff. So you're not trying to practice it in a time of, of crisis or a meltdown. Um, I do, I work with adults and we, we do a lot of the same thing around our, you know, wellness planning and, and whatnot. So I, I really appreciate that perspective and it's very good advice. Um, we do have a couple questions from a couple attendees. Um, so a question from one of the participants, if we could work from home, and this is geared towards everybody, um, if we could work from home, but it's taking a toll on our mental well-being and relationships, to have two parents working from home with two kids at home, at what point should we put the family member's mental well-being above the perceived physical illness or risk of COVID and choose to put them back into childcare? And this is, you know, in, in, or in your opinion, what's most important? And she says, this is a million dollar question, right? <laughs> so who, who would like to take a stab at that one first? <laughs> so balancing out, you know, dealing the risk of COVID, uh, family relationships. Um, anybody, I, well, you guys are all being quiet on this oh. one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got Peter. All right. I love her something, but I, I think that, <laughs> um, what Jonathan back in there as a, as a yes. medical professional. Um, Absolutely. It is, um, I, I just want to, uh, I hear that question. Um, I just finished managing three weeks of summer camp for 220 children spread over the three weeks. So I look more like a grandpa than I did three weeks ago. <laughs> um, and that safety, I just want to say like the <clears throat> having, it was just so viscerally obvious like to every, everyone how happy the kids were to get to go outside in small groups of nine and play and adventure and experience and relate. We, you know, we gave camp masks. We did all that. <clears throat> the, I think one of the challenging things is the, the incredibly shifting flow of information. 
So I have been trying to keep up on the medical information on COVID and children. And it, it is mind boggling and so hard to put your finger on what is actually the risk. You know, I've give, been giving parents the YouTubes of the UCSF Grand Rounds about it that sounded like it was pretty safe. And then the next day Forbes comes out with two papers that say kids are spreading it like crazy and, and a danger to families if they're out in the world, but they cite two papers that haven't been peer reviewed yet. And so I just want to put that out there. It is um, really hard to sort through all that information. To try to answer your question, I, I think you're gonna have to go with your parental you know, instinct and do the best you can to keep kids safe and get them to play with other kids, get them outside, or you're talking about the working piece. I think there will be learning pods forming. Um, it's happening, we're being asked to do it, just essentially extending summer camp to do small group outings for kids. Um, finding that daycare that is um, going to be able to be mostly outside until the weather turns and having safe practices. There is good information on you know, best practices for handling groups of kids. And, and I, hope, I hope there are more options for parents. Um, the final thing on your question is, is you're hitting the nail on the head. I mean, in, in the jobs that a lot of us do, we're worried about the other public health problems that come from COVID, like deaths of despair, you know, to go on the extreme other end. And, and as a society, we have to balance that, you know, like the risk of COVID versus, you know, serious depression, addiction, alcoholism, all of that. So it, it affects us all. I don't feel like I'm giving a very clear answer, except I hear you, I feel, your, I, I feel the challenge, but anything you can do to get your kids outside to bolster their mental health should be highly valued. Just try to do it carefully. Well, it is a, it's a tough question to answer, and I'm sure it's weighing on a lot of people, and that's why I'm gonna bring Jonathan in on this one too. So we had a question from one of the participants about um, kind of balancing out the risk of um, you know, two parents working at home, two kids homeschooling. Um, at what point should you know, we put the family members' mental well-being above the perceived physical illness risk of COVID and choose to put them back into child care? And she said, it's the million dollar question. You're up, Jonathan. <laughs> well, you know, I think Peter brought up a, really, a, a few really good, uh, good points there. Um, so first off, I would say um, maybe getting some guidance from your healthcare provider on the, 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 the real risks. Because a lot of times we as parents, kind of that, that parent instinct actually may not be our parent instinct. It may be our own fears and anxiety. Um, and it may be misinformed, you know, when that anxious part of our brain takes over and starts making decisions for us, it doesn't always lead to good places. And oftentimes as parents, we react to our children, not uh, because it's necessarily the best thing for them, but it's the best thing for us to calm our own anxieties and fears down. So first, I, I would start by talking to your child's pediatrician or your own healthcare provider about, you know, what are your concerns? So you can get some guidance on what the risks are outside of all of these studies that come out one day and say one thing, and then the next day you're hearing something else. There are people across the country having very different experiences with this. I have um, two small children here in Truckee. Um, uh, eight and 13. And my sister is in Georgia with my niece and nephew, same ages. And the difference in experiences these kids are having are marked. And a lot of times I'm left as a, as a healthcare provider and a parent to question, you know, kind of um, the, the, the things I am or am not engaging in here and the, the pros and the cons. I'm, I'm constantly weighing risk reward, right? Um, and having to check in with that anxious part of me, right? Making sure that um, I'm making as best informed decisions as possible, uh, that I'm accepting myself as a good enough parent, that there isn't a playbook written for this yet. We're figuring this out as we go. Um, but when it comes to, uh, you know, potentially exposing uh, the community, our community or, or our kids um, uh, to COVID-19, and our concerns of, of, of their mental health, I think first getting some guidance from a provider. If you're concerned about your child's mental well-being, 
talk with their provider first, talk with their pediatrician, reach out, um, or reach out to your own healthcare provider. Or here in Truckee, of course, if you're concerned, you can reach out to the, um, uh, the, the, the kind of wellness and behavioral health department, including the Department of Psychiatry, um, if you as an adult um, are, are looking for help. There's, again, a lot we don't know, but there is a lot we do know. And one of the things that we do know, and this has been brought up, um, is that our child's anxiety is directly correlated and correlational and has been shown to be correlated to the parent's anxiety, right? So if, if we are highly anxious or highly reactive, the, the result more often than not is that you will have a highly anxious and highly reactive child. So doing what you can, again, uh, to take care of yourself and, and help lead your family through this. Um, but uh, so I'd start off just by slowing down and figuring out, okay, what exactly are the risks and benefits uh, from changing what you're currently doing in your household? Or have you thought of a different way to change? Um, it, may not, uh, it may not need to be, well, I either have to be at home and doing things the way I'm doing now and worrying about the risks of the mental health outcomes for my family, or I stop doing this and I, I do something completely and radically different. There might be steps in between, and there probably are. Um, and just talk, talk with people. There are supports out there. Thank you very much. Um, um, and since so Rebecca, I just want to chime in for just a minute too. Is yeah, like absolutely. When you're looking at childcare, know that it's not always necessarily a large childcare like ours. And so I definitely would encourage people to go to a licensed childcare because our licensing agent has supervision over us too and has set out a bunch of things that, uh, compliance things that we need to do and we've done virtual um, meetings and stuff. But also you may want to look at other options. Um, there's a lot of home daycares, a lot of places had not closed. And so sometimes something smaller might ease um, your mind and also just asking a lot of questions of, what are you doing and what do you can? And so there's those things too, is just be informed on the childcare and, and we're not a one size fits all either. There are plenty of other options too that may fit that style too, if that helps. Thanks, Rebecca. Jess, did you have something to add? I did, yeah, thanks. Um... Jonathan, for your perspective, I really agree with that. The whole mirror neuron, my brain is always, my child's brain is always reading mine. But I did just want to throw out there in terms of if you're concerned with um, your child's mental health, that school is starting soon. And every elementary through high school um, in our district does have at least one and sometimes two school counselors and a school psychologist. And so, um, you know, if, you're, if your kids are at King's Beach Elementary and you're concerned about them, please reach out to me. Um, and I and I think I can speak for all of the counselors to say that, you know, it's really our deep desire to support families during this time. Um, and I know we're all continuing to work hard to, to be able to meet all the needs as they arise. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, Kathleen, did you have anything to add on that one? Mm, I, I have, uh, yeah. I'm dealing with it all myself. I have a 15 year old and I have two 20 year olds and, you know, I'm always worried about even the 20 year olds, you know, going out and what are they doing? And it's, I think everyone's dealing with it. It's such a new, like uh, Jonathan said, territory. And I think we're just all doing our best. So stay informed and reach out, please reach out to our council, school counselors and these great people here too. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we have another question that I, I would imagine um, all of you may have uh, something to weigh in, but particularly Peter, I have you in mind, but um, with the challenge of kids not being able to play with friends, the draw slash desire for them to play video games and watch Netflix is so strong. We're struggling with convincing them not to rely on electronics. Any tips, ideas to help this not be a constant battle? The kids are 12 and 13. Peter, I know, I mean, just because you do so much with um, kids in the outdoors, do you have any, any advice for this parent? Well, it is very challenging um, and it, it's not going to go away. And I, I'm not the type of person who sort of goes on and on about the dangers of iPhones and screen time. However, it really is good for everyone to understand just how intentionally addictive um, these devices are. Uh, I, I distribute to parents a, a great essay called Silicon Valley's War on the Minds of Our Children that a, a prominent psychologist in the Bay Area wrote. Um, it's actually kind of fascinating. 
so it is, it's, it, it is really important to try to have some boundaries around it, some moderation com compromise, like, you know, you you play outside for two hours, then you get to come in and do your stuff on the screen for one hour, whatever you can do. It's, um, it's so important. Um, I would just, it's, it's when you really read about, you know, the, the lab at Stanford where all those designers came out of, it's called the tech, the persuasive technology lab. It's just, it's like big tobacco, you know, spiking cigarettes to make them addictive. And we're all, we're all, we're all addicted to that. So anyway, um, some kind of moderation. The other thing I would say that you mentioned in the lack of being able to play or, or be outside, it is hypo arousal is a common reaction when things are tough um, that we saw a lot of that at the beginning of shelter in place, just kids staying in bed and a lot of parental concerns about like, wow, I mean, teenagers can do that well in on good days, but it is, it's understanding that kids um, when the going gets tough, some kids are going to react to that stress. And what I mean, going get tough, like news, pa anxious parents, lack of normal, supportive structures of friendship, all that, they just dial it back. They sleep more, they, they get more sedentary. And so anything you get, A, just understanding that is normal and B, supporting them gently and consistently to be a little more active, to get out and really try to find those friends, you know, some kind of way that you feel like you can safely, maybe two families get tested and then your friends get to your, your two kid, your two groups of kids get to actually start playing. We are seeing families do that and it's really important. So yeah, you're not going to be able to eliminate addiction to technology or the compulsion to do technology, but I really encourage everyone to try really hard to put some boundaries on it, make some compromise about it, make sure that it's not happening too many hours of the day and good luck. It's a challenge. I think I read that article you mentioned, Peter, and it, it is fascinating. And a lot of the uh, higher ups in the world of technology will not let their kids play on a lot of these devices, which is frightening. Um, uh, I, I have a question, and this is something I've heard a lot in different circles, and I'm guessing um, our school counselors may be the best place to start. But there's been some concern from parents that because of COVID and homeschooling, there's concern that kids are gonna fall behind and potentially stay behind. And I imagine that the ability to catch back up is probably gonna vary depending on age and grade. Um, but between Jess and Kathleen, do either of you have some, some advice or information on those concerns? I'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, who's gonna take it? <laughs> I'll take it. Um, and again, you know, I can't speak to high school. I know it's a total in middle school. It's a different world, really. Um, but I am really comfortable talking about uh, the elementary school level. And what we know about um, brain development is that, you know, you want to get to that this part, the frontal part of your brain in order to learn, right? And so in order to connect your brain, um, you, our kids have to have like solid um, emotional regula regulation skills, right? A really um, strong foundation of that. Um, and then we can go into, into the learning. So I guess what, this is kind of a long way of me saying, like if as, as a community and families, we really concentrate on helping our kids develop resiliency, like Peter was talking about, and emotional management, you know, how do I deal with anxiety or depression, or how do I deal with things that aren't going the way that um, I really want them to, um, then we're creating this, this great space for them to be able to leap into um, a stronger educational foundation and understanding, which, which I think kids will get to. Um, there is a lot of thought about, you know, in, education has been moving too fast for little kids anyways. Um, you know, a lot of people think that kids sh um, aren't developmentally ready to read until the end of first grade. And, and, you know, we look at it like they should be able to read at the end of kindergarten. So there may be some space for um, dialing it back a little. 
and really focusing on um, those foundational skills that carry over even into college. Um, if we focus on those, then I think some of that lost learning that we're really concerned about will, will bounce back. And as educators, just know that we're gonna pick your kids up wherever they are and we're gonna take them to the next level and get them progressing. So um, we know it's gonna be a challenge, but um, you know, I know just from working at our school that we're, we're gonna be able to take it on. I'll add, I'll add one little thing there, just on, on the older kids side, you know, the beauty of working in alternative ed is, I just want to offer this, like the anxiety parents have about, you know, their kids' test scores, the, the pace, the, the need to, you know, be progressing on along a perfect trajectory to get into a good college. I've seen so many cases of once the youth gets the spark to learn something, they can go to Sierra College, they can go to UC Berkeley, they can get a, they can become a doctor, like the kids can catch up. And I, I just think that's the beauty of American education is like I right now could go get a PhD if I, if I wanted to put my mind to it, you know, I was with my daughter who got one, but yesterday, um, but I don't have to, right? Like it's just, it's so this, this pressure we put on the 14 year olds to, you know, like the, their grades, this quarter determine their future is just, um, it's really false. You know, when, once a kid gets the spark and the motivation, they will do what they need to do with education. That doesn't mean we, you know, don't give them a lot of support and a lot of structure and try our best, but I, I think we all can take a deep breath and they're going to be okay. They're going to get educated. We're all learning as we go with this pandemic and we should all just relax a little bit. A lot of great teachers in this district ready to help kids. They will catch up. I totally agree with that. And I just wanted to say that I've, I've heard from different parents. And I think, Peter, you mentioned this last night when we were getting ready, that some kids are thriving in this environment, this online learning. And that is like, wow, they get this chance to really thrive. And, you know, some kids aren't. The social kids who really need to have more social interaction. But like, I, I, I really agree that they can catch up. I mean, it's the whole world is in the same boat. I mean, and teachers are there because they love kids and they wanna help them and get them to where they need to be. So I totally agree, sorry. Oh, thank you. Um, so we have a, a, little bit, a little bit of time left here and I figured um, you know, there's definitely some themes that when we all, a few of us met the other night um, and we've been emailing back and forth and a lot of the common things come up in terms of creating routines, creating a space dedicated to setting, managing time, managing emotion, taking brain breaks, um, keeping connections and social interactions going. Um, and again, this is gonna vary depending on the age group, but I would love um, maybe for each person, if you have a, a, a couple thoughts that you want to finish with, oh, we got one more question here. Um, so uh, what if your child is um, educationally smarter than you? I live in Tahoe, uh, two jobs, two job life and cannot get back to school. What do I do? So it sounds like looking for support um, to help with the education of the, the kids. So it sounds like re resources there to help with, with the studying. Anybody have something to add on that one? Um, I do know um, in Incline, it's Tahoe Tutoring is offering, was offering the end of the year last year, free tutoring for kids on, it would be through Zoom, but um, so connect with Incline Tahoe Tutoring. Um, I know teachers are willing to do one-on-one -on -one sessions with kids as needed. They're going to be, you know, working their full days, the teachers, um, and there will be time, you just need to reach out to the right person, uh, usually the teacher, and get some extra one-on-one -on -one help with your child. Don't hesitate because, you know, they're, they're working it out right now, they're getting prepped, they're getting ready to do online learning in the morning, and then one-on-one -on -one sessions in the afternoon, at least at my school, that's what I heard today at a meeting we had. So, um, yeah, contact myself or Jess or the other counselors at the school and we can help set, you know, get you set up with what you need. I know it's, everyone's got a different situation. It's tough. Anybody have anything to add on that one? 
just just from the school front you know if um any there's like a, a spectrum of um things that could be challenging like your kid might be doing math that you don't understand or you might be noticing wow it seems like they're you know a lot um farther behind than some of the other kids in their class um it's our job to to respond to you right and to support what your needs are so reach out to the teacher um the admin uh, myself the counselors like you know we really want to hear from you so that we can help move you through this process um as gently as possible oh, thank you and and to add um says this child is an honor roll student that they're discussing and and the wink link is me from our participant here um um, so it sounds like addressing, uh, if I'm reading this right, addressing the parents' needs in terms of being, is it, are you wanting to be able to help your child more as a parent or is it more resources to help the student? Because it sounds like your student's doing really well, so I think you're doing a good job if they're on audit roll and the teachers are doing a good job. But um, if you'd be a little bit more specific on, do you feel like it's you that needs the support or, or um, more for your for your child or kind of uh, support to help continue to stay structured for your child so they do stay at, at, on the honor roll is that um if you can give me a little more detail that would be great and and if uh, oh so okay so this is the parent that needs support um it, yeah the, the student is on the honor roll and the parent really needs some support um what options are there for parents yeah i mean i i guess i would just say it back to what i was talking about like like help I mean, I know it's more challenging now, but but I would try to support that student to get some connections out in the community that would feed their desire for learning. And you know, maybe there's a little internship to do, or um, you know, there's a lot of really interesting adults that that have energy to give to kids who are eager to learn and and succeeding like that. And um, I get asked about internships pretty often and, and that's a nice thing so it I, I don't know how old your child is but that um in adolescence that's what they're seeking help help them find some connection that that feeds their intellectual curiosity and and he, even they're even in a perfect even if you were a professor your kid would need to do that with other adults and and that's what they're supposed to do I know you have to, you know, manage it more carefully now with COVID, but um, uh, an eager learner should connect out in the world and learn. There's a lot to do. Uh, um, so the child is 13, and um, and I think in this particular parent, I, I have to say, if your child is on the honor roll, you are very much doing a lot of great things. So, um, uh, you know, I would say don't be so hard on yourself, but I understand wanting to be more helpful. Um, so in, you know, and for a parent wanting to be able to help their child, um, and especially for a child that's excelling at that, you know, higher educational level. Um, again, I think you should be very proud of yourself for where your child is at. You're doing a great job and the, the, the uh, teachers are as well. Um, but what support for the parent, um, and do you feel like, is it, do you need support in helping your child with homework? Is it, um, you know, you even a little bit more specific on what would help you feel more supported in this process? So, so resources really for parents who want to be more helpful. Um, I want to put out two things. Um, one is, uh, you know, our district does have a dedicated person, Karen Martin, who works with um, gifted and talented um, youth, you know, K through, um, uh, I want to say 18, but, you know, 12. Um, so she is a resource, um, you know, that you can reach out to um, for support with, because there's tons of things out there, lots of websites and books, and all, there's a lot out there that you could get connected with. Um, so she might be a great resource for you. But um, my other answer stands too is like talk to your your child's teacher or the admin. Um, you know we're immersed in education theory and resource, and um, we're more than happy to to support you and direct you um, in a way that'll make you feel like you're um, more successful in supporting your child. It sounds like you're doing a great job, and again, don't beat yourself up. <laughs> All right, they say thank you. 
I agree. I agree. You're doing, I think you're doing a wonderful job. So, well, we have a few minutes left here. I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, uh, I want to know if, if anyone maybe want to take a, a minute or two to go through if there's any final thoughts we didn't cover. Um, any, any last words, you know, keep in mind that, you know, this is just the start. We kind of, uh, kind of, this thing just kind of came together. We know there's a lot of variation in things to address, you know, whether it be technology, different age groups, different schools. So, you know, we hope to do that in the future. Also, if there's any t specific topics that you really want a dedicated, um, session information on, just throw them in the chat and that way we know what you want because we're doing this for you. Um, but, but on that note, um, well, um, Jonathan, do you have any final words of wisdom for this evening? Final words of wisdom? Words I, don't of wisdom. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, Are you driving? Uh, no, no. Yeah, here's my final words. Don't drive and, and, and be in a Zoom meeting at the same time. So I'm not moving at this, at this time. Um, yeah, I be patient with yourself, right? Be kind to yourself. Um, again, my my biggest um, my biggest theme when working with parents um, who's uh, uh, who are struggling um, with with their kids and kind of with the household, it goes back to something I touched on earlier, um, and it's learning the art of. Um, how we unconsciously respond to our own anxiety, thinking that we're caring for someone else, uh, when really what we're doing is we're trying to care for our own reactions and our own fears. Um, and if you're struggling with that, uh, again, there there is help, there's support. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure that there's going to be a list of resources either at the end of this talk or up on the Tahoe Forest website of where you can go if you're looking for that support, or just looking to ask some questions and explore, um, but there's help out there. Uh, let's see. Wait, you moved around. Now, Rebecca, you, you moved. I was going to go in order and you moved. Rebecca, do you have any final uh, thoughts or last words here for uh, to wrap up tonight? Um. I mean, no, I kind of feel like I said it all, but I would say just modeling your response to things um, because I deal with just that really, really early education. I mean, that brain development is just, they're always watching us. They're always want to see how we're reacting. And I think us having a calm demeanor and a proactive stance to it and just getting that in the brain. I mean, there's so much of that life skill that is just so young before they even hit the elementary. Um, and so just be kind to yourself and have joy with the kids. I think that's the piece that sometimes we miss is just laugh, have joy, dance, be silly, tell jokes. I mean, whatever it is. I mean, just let the kids know it's not the end of the world too and kind of help to keep some of that normalcy. So I would say modeling how you react to it, which I, everybody else has said too, is modeling your reaction and helping them be able to understand that you know, it's okay. You can be resilient and this is how we're going to do it. And we're here together as a family or we're here together as good friends or we're here together as extended family. Um, whatever that circumstance is of the tribe that you have around you that you all team together and make everything work for each child and for each person in the family too that you support each other. So that'd be my final word. Thank you, Rebecca. Jess, some final words of wisdom. I don't know if the words of wisdom, but a, a good resource that I, I really like, we haven't really touched on it specifically tonight, um, is Growth Mindset. So this is, um, this book is really accessible for parents. It's called Mindsets for Parents. Um, and it really helps um, build that um, modeling and that internal dialogue that we also haven't touched too much on um, that will really help carry our kids through difficult times. So it is so important to model, to, to mirror what their feelings are. You know, I see that you're sad, but we also really want to follow that up with, um, with, with that you believe that they can handle it, right? And so um, that's really what's going to get them. They notice their feelings and they know they can do something about what that, whether that's mindfulness or exercise or, you know, any of your self-care stuff. So this growth mindset for parents is a really great resource that you all can very easily read and cue into and I'll give you some real specific um, verbiage so that you know how to handle these big challenging moments, not only with yourself, but with your children. 
Right, thank you. Um, Kathleen, any words of wisdom for tonight? I really agree with what everybody said. It's like that book is great and I agree with um, ha how they handle their emotions. My one thing I would say is if your child might be interested, maybe get them into a new hobby that they can do you know, at the house, painting, um, playing an instrument. There, I know there's some uh, Tahoe Music School offers online lessons. Um, if you ha have that uh, available to you, uh, anything that they could do that they can let out some of their um, inner feelings, emotions. Uh, my daughter's doing painting right now all the time. That's like one of her things she has to do every day instead of just being on the technology, but just getting them able to uh, have an outlet too, but please reach out for, to our, the counselors at our schools too, and we can give you suggestions too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Peter, before I forget, I wanted to get the name of that article you mentioned. I can't remember the, um, the one about the technology um, by the psychologist in San Francisco. You can send it to me later, but one of the participants is interested and I, I can send it to her. So, and your last final words of wisdom, Peter. Okay. For this evening. Well, this has been great. I think um, just sort of a frame around um, a lot of great information um, from everybody. I think that's helpful when, when the going gets tough, I, I think the three R's are really helpful. And I, and I know Jess is really familiar with this, but this comes from Dr. Bruce Perry. We tend to, to, as adults, as parents, we want to kind of, we're kind of stuck in our heads. And when kids are having a hard time, it's not the verbal part of the brain that's having a hard time. It's actually some of the deeper structures where we feel anxious, where we, we feel sad, where we feel worried. And, and the three R's would be regulate, relate, then reason. And I just think that's a really helpful frame for kids at any age. If, if the going gets tough, we're not going to logic them away from that. We just have to, you know, help them regulate. Let's breathe together. Let's take a break. Let's sit and then relate. The words aren't even as important, especially for younger kids. It's the, the caring, loving tone in the voice that that's registering relation. And then we can reason, but just um, that order really helps to try to remember that not to just go right to like talking a kid out of their fears um, or their anxiousness. Same thing for us um, as adults, but I think, um, I think we will get through this. It's, um, I always try to look on the cup half full side of things and it's a really interesting time to reimagine how education works. I guess in a, some ways we're all reimagining how parenting works with you know, such limitations. Um, we're reimagining how healthcare works. Um, so everyone should breathe and together we will get through this and i think it'll we'll come out with some really interesting new ways of thinking about things hang in there absolutely thank you very much um, we do have a resource list um i put the wellness email up here for the hospital because it goes to our wellness center and we're all connected myself and then the wellness team so any anything that comes up can make it to me or uh, Jonathan or Rebecca, and certainly we can forward any information or questions to uh, Peter, Kathleen, or, or Jessica. Um, so it's, uh, it's easy to remember, wellness at tfhd.com. If you want a copy of the resources, anything else, any questions, comments that come up, um, a little bit of information on the different organizations here. Again, this email is really easy to remember. So if you can't remember something, we are always happy to help. And this is a great way to get a hold of anybody within the health system. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and stop the recording for now. Thank you all very much for coming. And uh, if any, but oh, wait one second here. Where is the recording button? Here we go. Um, I'm going to turn this off real quick. And that way, if anybody wants to ask a